Uh, so officially welcome to our uh, July webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Vladimir Milatic. I am a psychotherapist working for TrickStop, also a physician and a mindfulness teacher. And hopefully I will be able to combine all these skills into something useful for you. Uh, our topic for, for this evening will be difficult emotions and how to handle them. Um, one of the reasons why I decided to, to have this topic is because I've noticed that uh, this tends to be quite an important issue once I start working with people who have uh, uh, either trichotillomania or some other form of uh, BFRB, body-focused repetitive behavior. Um, so this is why I thought it would be interesting to create a whole webinar so that people who are in the program can sort of expand their skills and people who are uh, not in the program can learn something useful that might be helpful for them. Um, so before we start with the with the material, let me see, just the slides won't move. Okay, perfect. Uh, let me just say a few words for those of you who don't know what TrickStop is, uh, and then we'll get started with, uh, with the webinar. So TrickStop is an eight week program uh, designed to help you cope with hair pulling. It's based on empirically validated treatments, so habit reversal training and acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a form of CBT. Once you join, or rather if you join uh, TrickStop, you will be assigned a therapist who will guide you through the process and then customize the structure of the program to fit your specific needs. And um, even if you don't want to join the program or can't afford to at the moment, uh, anyone can install the free self-monitoring app, which I highly recommend that you use. Even if you have your own therapist and you, you're not interested in the program per se, you can still use the app because it's entirely free and then you can share the data with your therapist. Um, so I highly recommend that you install the app. Um, so here are some of the topics that we will cover uh, this evening. Uh, I would, before, before I go into this, I'd like to say that you can ask questions throughout my webinar. Hopefully I will finish this in about 45 to 50 minutes and then we'll go to the, to the Q&A portion and I will try to answer as many of, uh, of your questions as I can. I would only ask you if, to please use the Q&A uh, button to ask questions because if you use the chat, uh, I won't be able to see all of your questions. I tried that once in one of the, the first webinars and it was really very difficult to get to the questions and scroll through all the, all the chats. So use the Q&A button if you, if you want to ask a question. So there, there are broadly two different topics that I will address tonight, this evening rather. Uh, so one topic is uh, sort of what are emotions anyway? And you know, since we obviously have to have them, you know, how do we understand them? So that will be one part. Um, it will start off like I always do in a slightly theoretical way, but then I will try to bring it down to earth and make it useful for you. And then the second part will address some techniques that you can use to manage and cope with difficult emotions. So hopefully you will get the basic tools to understand what it means to have a certain emotion and then what is it that you can do uh, to cope with that emotion. Uh, so let's see if I can if I can deliver on the promise. So uh, this first slide, I will just briefly go over it. Um, I wanted to say here is that we talk about emotions as if sort of they've always been around, but in psychology, we and in general in, in philosophy as well, we did we didn't really talk about emotions until the, the sort of early 19th century. When this man uh, on the on the picture here, Paul Thomas Brown, introduced the notion of emotions into the scientific discourse. Um, before that, we actually had two completely different categories to talk about what we talk about as emotions today. So one of these categories were passions, which were these sort of strong, overwhelming, very powerful emotions. And then you have this sort of lesser category of sentiments or uh, affectations. Uh, which were sort of slightly less intense and usually more pleasant emotions. And then it was only in the 19th century that we put all these together and said, well, let's just look at them as, as one entity. And then the, the definition that, that I gave you here 
as you will see as I read it, it's not a very useful definition, but I will tell you why I selected it. But first, let's get to the definition. So the man who invented emotions, so to speak, uh, defined them in this way. He said, if any definition of them be possible, they may be defined to be vivid feelings arising immediately from the consideration of objects perceived or remembered or imagined or from other prior emotions. So to me, this is very vague. I mean, if you just replace vivid feeling with, let's say, flow of ideas or, you know, a series of, of words or whatever, you will basically get the definition of thinking. But what's interesting to me here is the, the only word that I, that I uh, emphasized in the whole definition, which is consideration. Uh, and I really like thinking about it this way. Uh, when we interact with the world, uh, we can think about the world or we can feel the world. So those are two ways, roughly two ways, in which we can, we can understand the world. So thoughts and emotions share that in common. They just speak a different language. Whereas words are something that we very easily understand and we can very easily communicate. When it comes to emotions, that's slightly more difficult because they use a whole different symbolic system than the language does. Uh, but they do speak about the same, same object as, as Thomas Brown would say. So basically, if you only listen to your thoughts or if you only listen to your emotions, you only get one half of the, of the story. What's the downside of this, uh, and basically most other definitions of emotions that I came across, is that they're not very useful practically for me. Uh, since I'm primarily a therapist, when I, when I talk about emotions, I want to talk about them in a way uh, that is useful so that my clients and I can understand their inner experiences. And not only that, I would like to have a theory of, of emotion that will give me guidelines and tools that will allow me to understand someone's inner world and my own, of course, and then provide me with a translation of that. So in order to do that, I will present a constructivist approach to emotions. And if this is not your first uh, webinar with me, then you have probably seen the man on the right. And <clears throat> You must have guessed that I will mention him at some point, because I think I've mentioned uh, the man's name is George Kelly, and I think I have mentioned his name at least once on every webinar that I have heard, that I've given. So uh, in the mid 1950s, Kelly invented this uh, school of psychology called the psychology of personal constructs, and to sort of to present it roughly, Kelly believed that with our behavior, we test out certain assumptions and certain hypotheses about the world. And then uh, if we confirm them or disconfirm them, we form basic experience. And this experience is stored in constructs. Now, we have a number of constructs that operate in our psyche. And that's basically what gives meaning to our world, to our inner world and our external world, right? It's kind of like, um, well, I'm wearing glasses. So that's what it is. Like a construct will, will be like, like glasses. It will color your world in a certain way. So according to Kelly, not all constructs are equally important and they're not all the same. So they're organized hierarchically. I found this, uh, this image on Unsplash and it's, I think it really nicely sort of illustrates what I'm talking about. On the top of the pyramid or this structure, whatever this is, you have only a few constructs and we call these core constructs. And then the periphery, as you go towards the periphery, you get more and more and more and more constructs. The ones on the top, the core constructs, they tend to be a little more abstract and sometimes more difficult to put into words. And those on the periphery tend to be more concrete. Those on the very, very top, so the core constructs, they basically um, represent who we are or the way we like to see ourselves. So what social roles do I play? Uh, what kind of a person do I want to be? What are my values? That's more or less what's contained in my core constructs. And then as you go lower, those in the periphery, they tell you how you go about being a good person. So it's, it's like a practical, uh, practical way of being a good person in the world, whereas what's in the core is, is an idea of a good person. And so you may ask me now, so where are emotions in all this? And I would say that's a very good question. Um, they're not here, they're in the water. 
and I mean in the water on the picture, and that's also what I mean in the in the in the real world. Uh, I'll try to explain where emotions fit into this by using these two these two examples. Those are both pieces of contemporary art, and they illustrate the same same point that Kelly is trying to make. Uh, so the piece on the left is uh, a performance piece by Marina Abramovich called The Artist is Present from 2010. Um, so in this performance, maybe some of you know who she is, but she's an incredibly influential artist. And this is, I think, her longest performance to date. So uh, it's called The Artist is Present, and that's basically the core of the performance. So it was, it was held in MoMA in New York. And so she was sitting on that chair eight hours every day for, I think, around 750 hours in total. And so everyone who, who would uh, visit the gallery would be able to sit across from her. And the instruction that they would get is that they can uh, communicate with her non-verbally and without touching, and that they can just stay there as long as they like. And so the, the reason why I like this is because it sort of lays bare, just disposes of everything that's not important. The only thing that creates an, a piece of art here is how you interact with the artist. So it's not what she does, it's not what you do, it's not what kind of dress she's wearing or what the chair is or where the hall is and there's no political statement there, there's no, there's, there's no predefined idea in this performance. And so everyone who sits there and looks at her will get a different performance. Because if I come and sit in front of her, I will, I don't know, let's say look her in the eyes, and then I will see something in those eyes, and then I will react based on that. She will look back at me and then react at me. And so essentially the performance takes place somewhere on that table, right between the participant and the artist. And so every person that sits on that chair will have a different experience and therefore will get a customized performance. The piece on the right is called a fluid structure, and it's a, it's a piece of digital art uh, that has sensors all over it. So as people move by or touch the, the screen or just stand in front of it, sensors react, and then the sculpture basically changes itself uh, based on how many people are around it. So everyone who sees the, the fluid structure will see a different structure. Uh, what both of these share in common is that um, they change depending on the the interaction that they're having. And the same goes for this, um, sorry, so the same goes for this uh, beautiful structure that, that I showed here. So Kelly had this beautiful mathematical way of looking at people, you know, as this kind of hierarchical structure of these beautifully organized geometrical constructs. But then he said all that is just momentary because uh, constructs are always situated in the world and they're always interacting with other systems and constructs. Now I'm interacting with you. You may be agreeing with my ideas, you may be disagreeing with this, um, you may have these or those thoughts, but they're all influenced by the fact that I'm telling you this. And then later on when I see your questions, I will be in turn influenced by your questions. So my system of constructs is interacting with your systems of constructs. And as we interact with each other, we necessarily change each other. Uh, for example, for me, the artist is present is a beautiful piece of art. Like it's almost poetry. It's so simple and, and so effective. It's really beautiful. For some of you, it may really not even be art, for all I know. And then as we engage in dialogue, we might change each other's opinions. And the same thing happens with who we are as people, what our values are, and also how we go about cultivating those values in everyday life. So for Kelly, this is precisely where emotions are situated, not necessarily in the, in the constructs themselves, but in the way these constructs change when they interact with the world. Uh, so he would say that we form constructs based on our experiences, uh, our experiences come from our interaction with the outside world. But because the world is always changing, then the way we interact with the world has to change, and then consequently, we have to change. So new experiences will revise our old experiences. And so therefore, new experiences will change our old constructs. And so 
Kelly was a very original thinker. And when he wrote his sort of major work, which is this sort of 1200 page, uh, two volume book, um, he, I don't think he used the word emotion even once. And originally uh, psychologists, including some very famous ones, uh, were a little apprehensive about his theory because they would say, so it's really very beautiful, it's logical, it, it, it explains a lot of things, but where are the emotions? In fact, Kelly did talk about emotions, he just never used the term emotion. He used the term transition, and that's how to, he talked about emotions. Um, for Kelly, uh, the term transition is more appropriate because an emotion is really a signal. It's, it's information that a part of us is changing or is about to change. So kind of like the original definition that Brown gave, emotion, uh, emotions are really information about things that are happening to us. So when I'm, uh, for example, interacting with, with you now with this webinar, and let's say, um, so for example, I tried to change slides just now, and it's a little slower than I want. And then this invalidates a part of me that likes efficiency and structure. And that means that I have to change to adapt to the speed of the presentation, and that slightly upsets me. So when I feel that sort of this kind of weird jumble of sensations, According to Kelly, what I'm really feeling is that a part of me now has to change and adapt. So an emotion or a feeling is essentially a piece of information. Usually we like to talk about emotions as something that's opposed to reason. But as you can see here, for Kelly, emotions are also quite logical and quite reasonable. It's just that their logic is not necessarily the conventional logic that we can that we can understand with no effort. So Kelly also gave us more practical approaches to understanding specific emotions. I have boiled down some of his ideas here so that you can have a more practical sense about how this works. I will start with guilt because guilt is something that, in my experience, when I explain Kelly's theory to people, guilt is something that people understand just very, very easily. So for Kelly, guilt is essentially information that tells us that we have done the opposite of what we should do on a very, very core level. So for example, if I like to see myself as a kind person, and then I end up yelling at someone, I will feel guilty because I did exactly the opposite of what, what my identity tells me I should be doing. So when you feel guilt, then the question you should be asking yourself, according to Kelly, well, and me, um, is, at what level of my core constructs did I just make a mistake? So where did I step outside of how I see myself? Because what happens usually when we feel an intense emotion such as guilt or anxiety or fear or any of these is that we tend to cling to them and then we hug them and, and we sort of amplify them. And then emotions, instead of being useful information, end up being something that harms us and cause even more suffering. But if you look at emotions as just information, just messages that are arising out of your body, then you can apply very logical steps to decipher and translate that message. So for guilt, that means that you have stepped outside of what your identity permits you. Anxiety is very interesting. Anxiety for Kelly means that we are becoming aware that we're facing a situation, but we have no constructs to explain that situation. So anxiety is actually absence of constructs in a very practical sense that means absence of tools because constructs exist to give us tools so that we can act in the world so that we know what to say what to do and so on and then when you feel anxiety that means that there's something happening and you can't quite make sense of it threat for example tells us that our entire core structure may have to undergo some sort of a change. So it's a kind of uh, warning of an impending um, comprehensive change. Fear is like small threat. It's just one part of your, of your core structure that has to change. So when you feel threatened, that means that all of you, your entire identity, your entire self is under attack of some sorts. Like all of it is being invalidated. But when you, when you feel fear, it's just one 
fragment of, of your entire identity, or your entire being. Now, hostility and aggression are very interesting because Kelly gives, I think, quite original spins to these terms uh, compared to how we use them in psychiatry and, and in general, I would say, in, in, in psychology. So a person is hostile, according to Kelly, when the construct that they use doesn't work. So I, if you've been to other webinars of mine, then you know that I like to use art as examples very frequently because I just, I'm a nerd, so I just like read and I like art. And so uh, for me, that's like a good teaching tool because I think that one performance piece can convey a lot of complicated theoretical notions in a very practical way. So that's my idea, that's my construct. That's what I'm um, sort of, that's what I'm coming into this webinar with. And so imagine that I realized that it doesn't work. So when I look at the Q&A, there are like 50 questions saying, so how is this, how is this performance useful for us? Like, how, how did this convey anything about emotions? That would basically mean that my idea was not good. That my idea that art will explain some things is not good. So imagine, so logically what I should do then is of course change the way I approach things and then maybe use less artsy examples next time, right? That would be logical. I should adapt to the feedback that I get. But let's say that it's so important for me to explain things using art that I cannot imagine explaining things in any other way. So what will I do? If it's so important to me, maybe I will refuse to change. And then what I will do is I will start sort of um, fudging the evidence. I will start pretending that when you say I didn't understand, that you actually said I did understand. Uh, when you say I didn't understand, I will say, well, yeah, but that's not because my example is bad. It's because you didn't really try. So that would be hostility. It's when you, it's when you're being a very bad scientist. For example, you do a research as a scientist. Stats don't show what you want them to show. So you just play around with different statistical analyses until you find one that will confirm your ideas. That would be hostility. It's when we don't want to give up on how we see the world, even though some, on some level, we know that it doesn't work anymore. But we feel like we have no choice, and then we have to do the same thing over and over and over again, and to pretend that it's still working. So that's hostility. When you catch yourself being hostile, that's the question to ask then. So which, which of my constructs, which of my assumptions about the world have, have been in, invalidated? Where is it that I need to make the change? And why is it that I'm not capable of doing this? And then aggression is just a very, very funny approach to that. Kelly says, aggression is an exploration of the world. It's like an active way of testing your assumptions. I mean, obviously, sometimes when aggression is using the way we would use it colloquially, it's not a very good way to explore the world. But for Kelly, being aggressive just means you're willing to test your assumptions. But if you're aggressive and hostile in Kelly terms, not a very good combination. So I hope this makes it, you don't have to use these specific definitions if they don't fit your experiences. For me, at the end of the day, the, it's the principle that's important. The principle being that when you feel an emotion, the thing is, the, the, the question to ask is what is its message? Not how do I run away from this? Not how do I make it stop? How do I make it go away? How do I control this? The question is always, what is it telling me? What is the message that this emotion is telling me? So that's the principle. Whether or not these definitions will match your experiences and whether or not you will find them useful, I find them useful in clinical work, but if my clients don't find them useful, we'll just find another way of looking at things. Because what Kelly is giving us is more like a method rather than a recipe. Okay, so um, now that we have this part covered, um, or at least in, in, in rough terms, uh, I'm going to give you several ways to deal with very intense emotions. Um, some of these ways will be very quick techniques that you can apply in the moment when emotions arise. Some of them will require a little more work and a little more strategic cultivation for them to actually work. I, I selected sort of, I think maybe 
equal measure of both, let's say, so that you can have both the short-term tools and the, and the long-term tools. So tools that I will present is cultivating equanimity, uh, labeling and storytelling as a way of working with emotions, grounding in the body, self-indifference, which is not exactly how it sounds, and the RAIN technique, which I really like and find to be very, very useful. So we'll go over these um, very briefly, and I will try to illustrate that with, with practical examples so that you can see how it works. So we'll start with equanimity. Um, if you attended any of the previous webinars, you must have heard me talk about uh, compassion, loving kindness, and joy. And equanimity falls into this category. Together, these four are called the Brahma Viharas in, in Buddhist psychology, or, um, or the four boundless qualities, as I said. So uh, uh, loving kindness and compassion, and especially self-compassion, have become mainstream in the West by now, and there, there's a lot of research, and they're used widely in psychotherapy. However, equanimity has been slightly neglected, and I think it's very unfair because of all those four, equanimity is, is, is the state to cultivate if you want to gain a degree of, of stability you know, when you face dense emotions. So it, it was a little bit neglected. And I find that sometimes when people talk or write about it, they give a slightly negative spin on this. It almost appears like uh, you're being encouraged to be cold-blooded and disinterested, which is not at all the case. Equanimity, if, you, if you're not a fan of Buddhist psychology, so the way I'm presenting it here is not related to any spiritual or philosophical system. It's just how we would present it in psychology. But if you want to sort of go deeper and you don't like Buddhism, uh, the Stoics, for example, also talked about equanimity. So that's something that Western philosophy knows about very, very well. So here's a definition from, from uh, Sharon Salzberg's book, Loving Kindness. So she says, equanimity is a spacious stillness of the mind, a radiant calm that allows us to be present fully with all the different changing experiences that constitute our world and our lives. So just remove a few uh, words that make this sound a little floppy. Basically, when she says equanimity, she means stillness of the mind. So that means that when intense emotions arise or the urge to pull as well, uh, equanimity will allow you to stay calm and still. So you will, you will be able to retain composure and then observe and think through and then act on your emotions in a constructive way. Uh, if you want to learn more about the just com compassion and loving kindness and equanimity, share this book that I'm referencing here. I actually have it next to me. So this is a newer edition. This is an, a remarkable book. It's one of the best books on mindfulness that I have ever read. And since I teach mindfulness, I've read quite a number of them. So she's very practical. She writes very nicely. You can obviously see that she's a master teacher. And she gives a lot of very practical exercises. So you can find many different ways to cultivate equanimity in this book. I will present some ways here, also through meditation. But if you want to really go in depth, I would recommend her book. So this is Sharon Salzberg. Um, so what can we do actually with equanimity? Uh, because it is a state of stillness of the mind, equanimity allows us to discern things with precision. So when you're not in a rush, when you're not impatient, when you're not overwhelmed, you can, for example, very clearly see what is it that you can control and what is it, what is it that you cannot control. One of the biggest mistakes people make when they try to cope with emotions is that they basically try to sort of uh, overpower them in a sense, so to gain control over them. But when you, have, when you cultivate equanimity, you don't need to control the emotion because the emotion doesn't disturb you anymore. You can observe the emotion, you can look at it, but it doesn't, it doesn't really overtake you at any point. And because you know what you can control and what you cannot control, you also save yourself the frustration of trying to do something that's basically impossible. Because when we try to control our emotions and also our thoughts and also urges in the sense that you try to overpower them, to push them away, to sort of suppress them somewhere, 
they usually come back even more powerful. And you use an incredible amount of energy trying to do that. So you try to do the impossible. Obviously, you fail because it's impossible. And then you lose your energy and you end up suffering. So trying to, to wrestle your emotions, not the right way to go. Uh, so she also talks about, um, talks about equanimity as a kind of state of non-reactivity. And I find this to be maybe a slightly confusing term because it doesn't mean that you don't react. Maybe when you do this, the, the actual sitting meditation, you don't react. But equanimity in everyday life it doesn't mean that you feel sad and you sit and you know, just wait for the sadness to pass away. It means that you can approach sadness or anger or any emotion in a way that's proactive instead of reactive. So I would rather say not, I would rather say proactive than non-reactive. Because uh, if, if, if there are any of you here that are currently in the program, then you know that when we come to the session four, we start talking about values. And I like to combine the notion of being proactive with the notion of reacting uh, in accordance with your values. Because when you're very still and you feel an emotion, you can apply, for example, Kelly's framework for analyzing emotions. So let's say you feel guilt. And then you sit and you think, let me see, how is it that I've just deviated from my values? And then you go back to your values, see what the proper action would be, and then you do that. When you have appropriate stillness of the mind, this is a very quick procedure because you don't have to fight with your emotion. You just notice it arising, and then you do what your values tell you to do. So that's what non-reactive means. It means that you don't just instinctively listen to what your emotion appears to be saying with its intensity. Rather, you look at the quality of the emotion. In relationships with other people, Equanimity is actually knowing where your boundaries are. And to me, this is like an art form almost. Um, and also something that I've noticed that is quite important uh, with people who, who struggle with BFRBs. Uh, very frequently we talk about setting boundaries in relationships with other people, expressing how you feel uh, without fear of rejection, um, expressing your opinion without uh, being afraid to be called stupid or inarticulate or uneducated or whatever your fear may be. Uh, when, when you cultivate equanimity, one of the, uh, I said before that it's a tool that allows you to discern things very clearly. So one of the things that you can actually discern is in a relationship with someone, what's your responsibility and what is their responsibility? What are your intentions versus how they understand your intentions? And in that way, you can communicate more clearly and you can also learn how to say no and what not to take responsibility for. When, when you don't really know what to do with emotions and they just, when you don't understand their message and when, you, when you're not able to stay still when they come about, when you interact with someone, your emotions tend to become sort of slightly jumbled. So someone, you say something, the other person gets upset, then you get upset because they are upset, and then by and then you know you react from from you being upset because they're upset, and then they respond to that, and just gets piled up on and on and on and on, and then emotions get so intensified that sometimes you don't quite really know who is feeling what and who thinks what and who who intended for what to be heard in a way. This is a very confusing sentence and it really illustrates, I think, the, the state that I'm talking about. And what's, the, what's the, sort of the, the practical result of this? That means that sometimes in relationships, especially with loved ones, uh, what we do is we take on their, their responsibility for something. Uh, I can give you an example from therapy and I really like to use this example because I think it's very clear to people. As a therapist, my job is to help people. My job is to sort of use the knowledge that I have to understand their problem and then use the, the technical skills that I have to, to help them find the solution. But sometimes you will encounter people who are just not willing, not ready, not motivated to change. If I didn't care to help people I work with, I wouldn't be doing my job. So the component of compassion and loving kindness always exists in a therapeutic relationship, at least 
I, I can speak as opposed to myself, I can speak for every therapist in the world. But for me, this is a very important component. And then when you really do want to help someone and you care about helping them, and you see that they resist, they, they're not really willing to try anything, a therapist can very frequently then get frustrated. And then you offer even more tools, like try this, try that, you know, do this, read this book, you will ask 1,000 questions. And the more they say no, the more you will be upset. And somewhere in this process, unless you have this kind of stillness of the mind, uh, you will forget that it's not your responsibility. It's, it's your job to be there to help, to understand. But when a person leaves your therapy room, or when they log off, as the case may be from, from Trickstop, whether or not they will use the tools you offer, and whether or not they will use the resources, emotional and otherwise, that you can provide, that is not on you. That's not something that you as a therapist can control. And, and if, you, if you don't have this clear discernment of boundaries in relationships, you can end up very frustrating and feeling very bad about yourself for something that is really not your burden to carry. So that's also a very important aspect of equanimity, that in relationships, we know exactly where our responsibility stops and where the responsibility of another person begins. This doesn't mean that we don't care. It doesn't mean that we're not compassionate or kind. It just means that every person has to carry their own burden. That's just how it goes. We can help them, but they need to be willing to accept the help. So that's the trick. And then if you can see things clearly, then you can see if that's the case or not. So I just want to underscore one more time that equanimity is not indifference. It doesn't mean that you don't care about people or yourself if you retain stillness when things become very difficult. Uh, another thing about equanimity that I think is incredibly important for, for hair pulling specifically is that you learn how to open up towards suffering. This may seem like a masochistic thing to do, but it's not really. Uh, if we you go back to the beginning and what I was telling you about Kelly and how he envisioned our system of construct as being always in the process of change and revision, it, we cannot change unless we open up towards suffering because suffering really points to those places where our system of constructs or our personality needs to grow and needs to build. And unless you can open up and see that part very clearly and accept it, there's no way for you to grow and change. And when you have the stability that equanimity offers, then you can open up towards suffering as well. And then uh, this Igret is my favorite definition of equanimity by Peter Harvey. He said it's the opposite of how James Bond likes his martinis. So equanimity is stirred but not shaken. And I think that's a very good way to, to remember what it is. Uh, there are several ways that we can cultivate equanimity in meditation. Uh, there are two, let's say, groups of meditation that I like to recommend. One group involves visualizations, such as the mountain meditation or the lake, the lake meditation. And then another group involves uh, visualizing different people and reflecting on phases. If you ever tried any of the compassion of loving kindness meditation, you know that basically what you do is you establish a level of mindfulness you calm your body and your mind down, and then you slowly repeat a phrase such as, um, may I be well, may I be happy, and so on. Or you direct these phrases to other people, and then you reflect on, on how your body and your mind react to these phrases. And the same we do for equanimity. So some of the phrases that you can use for equanimity, for example, would be, every person is the owner of their own actions, for example, or, uh, every person is responsible for their decisions. Or if you visualize different people and then repeat the phrases to them, you can do things like, um, uh, I wish you happiness, but I cannot make you happy. Or I wish you happiness, but your happiness is the result of your actions, something along those lines. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, I, I will, when you receive the, the link to the YouTube uh, to recording of this, uh, of this webinar, I will also make sure to, to have people from, from Trickstop 
send you uh, two guided meditations for equanimity. Uh, I think two will be fine. So one with re repeating phrases and then one with visualizations and probably the mountain meditation. Because I think the mountain meditation is a very, very good way to practice and understand equanimity. So you will receive those two and then you can try them out yourself. So let's move on to labeling and storytelling. Uh, this is a way of dealing with emotions that you can use without any prior preparation. So whereas equanimity is something that you cultivate over time with regular practice, this is something that you can apply really anytime, anywhere, including now. So there are several ways you can approach this. Uh, the most basic way that I feel silly even putting there, but it is a way to do it, which is just to learn how to put your emotions into words. This really helps because uh, words have this effect of kind of just moving you, you know, a few inches away from the, from the emotions. You can think differently about something when you can put it into words. If you remember what I talked about in the beginning, that both emotions and, and thoughts are ways in which we make sense of the world, the reason why not only as people, but also as, as a culture as a whole, why we emphasize uh, thoughts over emotions is because thoughts are expressible with words and words kind of convey meanings that we all share together. So that's why putting things into thoughts makes them easier to manipulate and work with. So once you learn how to identify the emotion, you're already halfway towards translating it and seeing what it's telling you. You don't always have to find labels like um, this is guilt, this is anger, this is sadness, this is um, I don't know, hostility, this is joy. It doesn't matter. You can use any kind of label you like. So you can make up your own labels for emotions. As long as you know how to apply them consistently and recognize those states, you're doing well. So another way to do it, which is slightly more complex, but also more effective, is as the emotion arises, and especially if it's an intense emo emotion, is to use that moment to apply any kind of storytelling about the experience. So you tell yourself a story about what's happening now. You can even do that out loud if you're alone or surrounded by people that wouldn't think that's strange. Why is, why is this useful? Uh, when I was talking about equanimity, I was telling you about being proactive versus reactive. This is exactly a proactive approach because you are giving yourself a narrative to work with. Uh, you can do this in many ways. You can say stuff like, um, um, so like, let's say the last sentence on the slide. So my understanding of the situation is making me feel this and this. That's one way that you can do that. But the way I like to do this is that I like to play with associations, for example. Um, it, since I already told you I like art, I also like music and, and the, all kinds of music and all kinds of art, basically, and also all kinds of books. I will read really anything. Like when I'm out of books, I will read the, the back of the shampoo bottle just for fun. So something that I will do sometimes when I start experiencing emotions that I don't know what to do with, is that I will try to connect them to something along these lines. Like for example, I will try to connect them to a character from a book. I will try to associate them with a song. I will try to connect them to a piece of art. So sometimes, uh, I, for example, I've realized that uh, sometimes when I start becoming confused, I will tell myself that I sort of, I feel like I jumped into a Jackson Pollock painting. So if you like Jackson Pollock, then you probably know what his paintings are like. And then when I imagine jumping into that, I realize that I really don't know what to hold on to, for example. Or I can imagine, um, uh, so I was giving a similar webinar recently, and one of the examples that I gave is, how I learned to differentiate between different kinds of experience of sadness uh, by using music. So for me, uh, there's the kind of sadness that goes with Leonard Cohen songs, like a, um, a bird on a wire kind of sadness that includes like a tinge of loneliness. And then there's the Chopin kind of sadness, which is sentimental. Uh, and it's, it's a type of sadness that I can actually enjoy sometimes. So there's, this, there's, there's one type of sadness that I find, for example, difficult to be with, and then a type of sadness that I can allow, that I can allow it to overtake me and even kind of enjoy it. But the way I, I devised this division is not because I read it in a book, it's because I was thinking about 
what would be the soundtrack of what I'm feeling right now. Uh, sometimes there are books that I really like uh, that have narratives that are very easy to fit into certain situations in my life. So for a very long time, I used to use uh, bits and pieces of, of unbearable likeness of being uh, to identify um, different emotions. Uh, the reason why this works is because when, you, when you're able to relate your emotional state to, to a character from a book or a situation from the book, then you already have a verbal representation of that. And you have a, when you have a narrative, you have a way to resolve the narrative. So you can come up with a cognitive solution to the, to the problem. Another way to go is to focus on very concrete descriptions of what you're experiencing. So you don't have to say, I'm experiencing sadness, and this sadness reminds me of, I don't know, Chopin's mazurka or something like this. You can actually go the, in the opposite direction, and you can just go and describe what's happening on, in very concrete terms. So I'm standing here and here. Uh, this and this is around me. I'm feeling this in my body. I'm having these thoughts. As you recite this, you're basically sort of giving labels to your experiences. And if you're giving labels to your experiences, you can also manipulate them very easily. Another way is to recognize your experience as just your experience and not objective reality. So uh, I'm thinking that something is happening. It's different than to say this is happening. So um, to give you a, a very free common example, sometimes when you talk to people, you will notice them reacting in kind of strange ways. And then you will say, oh, this person thinks I'm silly. But this is, the thing is, you will not get upset if you think this person thinks I'm silly. You will only get upset if your thought is, I am silly. And there's a difference between this, I think this person thinks I'm silly, and I am silly. Because one recognizes that it's just an idea. It's just a hypothesis that you have. And another one makes you that kind of a person. And when you are a certain kind of a person, that's kind of very, it's essentializing and it's fatalistic. And it sort of invites you to cling on to that emotion and you merge yourself with it. And then you start to suffer because of it. Because you can say, I, sa I said, a thing that sounds stupid and is one thing. And then another thing is to say, I'm a stupid person. If I'm a stupid man, then that's it. There's no hope for me. But if I said something that sounds stupid, well, there's just one thing I said, and it's also, you know, sounds stupid. So it sounds stupid to me, but it may not sound stupid to you. So when you recognize your experience as just your experience versus an objective fact, then this experience becomes just one way to explain things instead of the way. So if you feel uh, like you fail at something, for example, and naturally you feel guilt, threat, anxiety, if you infer from this that you're a failure, so you feel guilt, so you've done something wrong, therefore you're a failure, well, that's quite a hopeless state of mind, isn't it? One that kind of sets the stage for pulling. But if you approach guilt as an experience that is telling you that you may have done something wrong, then you have a way to be constructive about it. I hope this, this makes sense as an approach. If, if it sounds silly, try it anyway, because these are very, very powerful techniques and they've helped me on so many occasions. Um, so um, let, let me give you just one practical example. I just thought of this. I remember when I was when I was uh, passing my medical boards, and um, if there are any medical students or doctors among you, you know how difficult the boards are. And so I was not afraid for step one, which is maybe the hardest one, but I wasn't afraid of it because I'm good at science. I wasn't afraid of step two clinical skills because, well, I just I I like that kind of reasoning, so it was fun for me. But I was afraid of clinical skills. Uh, I, so I'm not even sure what kind of uh, perception of me you can get, but I'm, I'm kind of an introverted person, and I, I like to do things at my speed. And the clinical skills exam is with actors who pretend to be patients, and then you're timed for every examination, and 
there's a lot of pressure from the time constraints that you get. And also when people are pretending to me that's already an artificial situation. So it's really very stressful that one, even though it's probably the easiest of the board exams, but never mind. For me, it was very stressful. And so I remember standing in front of the door, waiting for the signal to start my first exam. And suddenly I just had all these thoughts coming, like, what if you forget this? What if you forget that? Uh, you always mix up these two things. What if you write the wrong thing? What if you don't think of all the possible differential diagnosis? And then my, start, start, my heart started racing. And, and then I thought, okay, what on earth is happening here? And so I tried to put my emotions into words. And the way I phrased them in that moment is, you're being hysterical now. Just, just why are you being hysterical? And then I started to see what does it mean for me in that moment to be hysterical? So I noticed the, so I noticed two things in, in the moment. One, I feel like I might forget something. And second, I might not be fast enough. And then I thought, well, if you're not fast enough, you're not fast enough, you'll practice next time. You can only do it as fast as you can. And suddenly that kind of melted away half of my, half of my worries. And then I looked at the other side. I might not think of something. Then I thought, sure. And then I looked at other people around me and I thought, well, you know, they also might not think of something. And then I thought, so if, you, if you're afraid that you're not going to think of something, so you don't really trust yourself, <laughs> but you trusted yourself enough to do a lot of different things in your life, including graduate from medical school, so maybe you have been doing something right. And then when I thought about that, I thought, well, yeah, there's really no reason for me not to trust myself. I can't know whether or not I will pass or fail, but there's no reason not to trust myself. And so sort of that melted away the other half of my emotions. But I first had to put my state into words to be able to analyze it. I mean, luckily I did pass, but I really, that was a very important moment for me because if I went in and started the exam with all the noise in my head and all the intensity in my body, I really suspect that I wouldn't really do as well. So the second approach is grounding in the body. I will show you two different ways to find sort of a safe space in your body and two different ways to ground yourself. You can try both, but my recommendation is to combine them and use both of them. This is the first way. So when you start feeling a very intense emotion, you don't have to try and put it into words if that's not your cup of tea. Uh, I mean, I talk very much as you can see, so putting things into words is something I like doing. But if that's not your cup of tea, you can actually focus just on your body, not even to identify an emotion in your body, just to go systematically through different, different parts of your body and then see what is it that you're happening, that, that you can notice what's happening, and then describe that to yourself. So describe what you're experiencing, but on, the, on a very concrete level. So first, what you describe is where is it that I'm feeling something? Is it in your chest? Is it in your abdomen? Is it in your arms, in your head? So where is it what you're feeling? What's the size of that sensation? What is its shape? If you like to visualize things, you can visualize a color. So you can ask yourself how intense this is, like rated from one to 10 or zero from 10, zero to 10. Um, is it a dy dynamic or a static sensation? So does it change or is it solid or is it liquid? So this the dimension of solidity and liquidity, for example, for me is very important because over the years, I've noticed that some of my, my emotions are very solid and some are less so. So if I feel guilt, for example, for me, guilt is like feeling a brick in your stomach. It's very intense, it's very firm, and it has a very definitive shape. But for example, when I feel joy or tenderness or even sadness, they will be more liquid and they will move around in my body. And then what you do, especially if it's a dynamic sensation, you observe it and follow it. By doing this, you're actually gathering material to learn about your emotions. Even if you can't put them into words, if you can connect that you feel something in your stomach in, in a certain group of situations, you can just list them and then see what's in common to all these. And that way you can learn what the message is as well. 
Another thing is that when you break down an emotion to a group of sensations, they become more manageable. One of the reasons why emotions overwhelm us is exactly because they come like swarming suddenly. So you don't know where to look and what to pay attention to. Kind of like my example from, from, from my exam, where suddenly I had all these thoughts coming in, all these bodily sensations, and then like you don't know what to attend to first. But if you deliberately focus on your body and break it down to a specific sensation, you make it more manageable. And you also separate it from thoughts, so you make things slightly more easy for yourself. That would be one approach. Another approach is when emotions start coming up. You can briefly map them in your body like you would in the previous exercise. That's not what you focus on here. So here you're actually looking for those parts of your body that don't react, that are still that, that are still still, that are still and unaffected by the intense emotion. And then what you do is you focus on that part of your body that is still peaceful and calm, and then you try to amplify that sense of calm. Uh, one thing that, when you apply these techniques over time, you will notice that that certain parts of your body will tend to, to be peaceful most of the time. So for me, for example, that would be my back. So the way I'm sitting now and the way I generally sit, I can, every part of my body can be affected by something. But if I just pay attention to my spine, for example, I realize that it's very, very firm and, and, and very stable. And then I focus on that sense of stability. And what that does is that it shifts the balance of how you perceive your emotional state. When, when, an, when an emotion arises, especially if it's a bad one, you tend to look only at that. And then you disregard other parts of your body or resources that you have or thoughts that you have that might be helpful. You just look at what's destabilizing you. And this way, when you pay attention to what's upsetting you, but also what's making you stable, you bring a kind of balance to the way you look at your situation. This is, this is a way of working that I really like. If I'm in a situation where I can, for example, take time to try and, and, and feel my spine, something that you can do is just put your feet on the ground and then press them as hard as you can to the ground. And then what you do, if this is the ground, and then you press your feet to the ground, you pay attention to this to, to this entire surface where, where the sole of your of your foot is or your, your soles of your feet rather are touching the ground and just feel that feel how stable and firm the ground is that will produce a similar effect you can also so just hit the ground as well you can alternatively if you're sitting on a firm chair you can use all the parts of your body that are touching the chair so uh, you know, your your legs all the way to your, to your spine, so the entire part. And just lean in with all your weight and focus on, on that sensation. That's one way to remind yourself that you are safe and firmly grounded, even though you're experiencing a very intense emotional response. The good thing about this is that you can do that even when you're in front of other people you're standing, it's not that difficult to focus on your feet touching the ground or even on your spine, right? People can talk to you, you can talk to them, but all the while you can remain connected to the ground. And therefore, I like to call it, to me, this is like equanimity on demand. So it's not something you cultivate, but it's something that you can get in touch with very quickly. So now another, uh, another way of dealing with um, with emotions that slightly, that also require, it's more of an approach to emotions than a technique that you apply in the moment. I find this concept to be very interesting and don't be swayed by the by the name. So here's the definition from, from Melissa Dahl's article that's called How to Survive a Cringe Attack. So she says, self-indifference is a relief of realizing that you're simply not that big a deal. The best, if counterintuitive, way to truly feel better about yourself is to see yourself as you really are, meaning not that big a deal. Uh, this is not to suggest that you shouldn't care about yourself. So what she's talking is something slightly different. 
the concept of self-indifference actually comes from self-compassion. So these are some of the components of self-compassion. So it's openness to your own suffering, which connects it to equanimity. It's being moved by your suffering. And most importantly, it's the desire to relieve your own suffering. That's self-compassion. And I put these two, uh, two things apart from others because this is where self-indifference comes from. So uh, compassion or self-compassion is a non-judgmental attitude to your own shortcomings and failings. So when we fail at something, for example, when you pull, compassionate thing would be not to be upset with yourself, not to judge yourself, but instead to help alleviate some suffering. Because if you spend time explaining to yourself what a horrible person you are for just pulling, that just adds more suffering on top of an already difficult situation. So you're making things worse, not better. Compassionate approach would try to make things better, not worse. So compassion is the opposite of judgment. Uh, and then the second thing is recognizing the universality of suffering. So when you put these two things together, which is not to judge yourself, but to accept your failings, and to recognize that you're not the only person in this world that fails, this is where you get self-indifference. You don't torture yourself by being unnecessarily hard on yourself because you realize that you are a fallible human being just like any other human being. In that sense, we're just not that big a deal. I'm not that big of a deal, you're not that big of a deal, but not because our suffering doesn't count, but because we have this shared experience of suffering. Uh, one thing that I very frequently encounter in psychotherapy is that people tend to look at their own suffering as being so unique that it's not shared with anyone. This is troubling in two different ways. One is because it makes it very difficult to help someone who thinks that no one can possibly understand their suffering because they didn't live the exact same life that they did. And second of all, it makes you feel isolated. When you feel that your suffering is just yours and unique and unlike anyone else's, you have no one to relate to. And then you feel you suffer and in addition you feel lonely and you feel closed off from the world. So self-indifference is something that actually connects your suffering to the suffering of other people instead of separating you from it. I hope this, this makes sense to you. And then in another article, she goes, the article is called The Power of Self-Indifference. She goes on to say, you're important and you're worthy of love, just like we millennials were taught in school. But that's true only because everyone is important and everyone is worthy of love. You matter because everyone else matters. So you are important, but only because everyone else is as well. So self-indifference is a kind of approach to your own suffering. So when you feel the urge to pull, that's not something that only you feel. It's something that many other people feel. Uh, I think it was two months ago or last month, I'm not really sure, uh, when we had that webinar on, uh, on, the, on scientific research related to pulling, and when I was giving those epidemiological information about how common pulling is and all that, I remember there were many comments in the Q&A box about how surprised people are, how common that is, and how many people suffer from this. Because very frequently, people with BFRBs feel very lonely because no one talks about pulling, no one talks about picking. We talk about mental health very much, and we talk about anxiety, we talk about I don't know, bipolar disorder, all these things that are more rare than pulling this, for example. And yet every person that pulls will feel, feel lonely because they never hear their stories told. So they don't have, well, you don't have the opportunity to connect to that kind of sense of shared suffering. This, I think, also illustrates the power of community. Uh, speaking of which, uh, the TrickStop website has a forum. Um, the forum is not very active now, but there's a lot of you on this call right now. So go join. It's obviously free, it's just a forum, so you can exchange experiences. Just reaching out to other people who suffer from the same thing as you do can, can in a sense, relieve your suffering. So that's what she's talking about. So for me, 
the, the opposite of self-indifference would be something along the lines that this quote is illustrating. The deepest and most organic death is death in solitude, when even light becomes the principle of death. In such moments, you will be severed from life, from love, smiles, friends, and even from death. And you will ask yourself if there is anything besides the nothingness of the world and your own nothingness. To me, this is the state that in the most extreme form that we fall into when we sort of venerate and, 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 and consider our suffering so precious. Our suffering is most certainly very important, but if we isolate it and only look at our own suffering and shut ourselves off from the world, we end up in a kind of nothingness where only suffering exists and nothing else. And when you, when you feel so isolated and disconnected and so entrenched in your own, embodied in your own suffering, there is no space for healing anymore. If you go back again to Kelly and to Marina Abramovich's performance, our lives take, take place through interaction with other people. So when we close ourselves off, not just for the fun stuff, and, but also for the, I mean, when, when we close ourselves off for the suffering, but only participate in the fun stuff, we only get half of life and half of human interactions. So sharing our own suffering and trying to understand the suffering of other people actually makes our suffering, suffering less intense. And so let's go on, just one second, let me see what time it is. Of course, I'm, I'm behind schedule, I apologize. Um, so this is the RAIN technique. Uh, this is a very practical mindfulness-based technique, but it's not something that you do when you sit and practice mindfulness. It's something that you actually apply in situations when you feel bad. Uh, RAIN is an acronym for recognize, accept, investigate, and non-identify. So Tara Brack, uh, the woman on the picture on the right, she wrote two books, and her second book, the latest one, Radical Compassion, basically talks about RAIN in many ways. She's otherwise, she also has a lot of recorded meditations about different ways to do RAIN. So you can go on her website, which is, I believe, terabrack.com, and you can download a bunch of free, free meditations if that's the way you like cultivating uh, mindfulness and dealing with your emotions. But you can apply this very easily in everyday life. So um, the, the last time when I was in the position to use the RAIN technique was very recently because I was traveling and I was on a plane and um, you know, we have to socially distance everywhere, apparently, but not on planes. So I was boarding the plane and I realized that it was crammed with people. There was not a single seat free. So I was wearing my mask because, you know, well, I'm trying to be a responsible citizen. And so I did everything I could do. I disinfected myself entirely. And so I was sitting there and I realized that I'm very, very uncomfortable. Uh, otherwise, I always think that planes are too small and they're not very comfortable. But now, with all these people around me, it, I felt like almost everyone has COVID. And then suddenly I started paying attention to how close they are, how they're touching me when they're moving away. Or, um, you know how when you look at people and suddenly you notice that everyone is coughing? Like, suddenly everyone feels the need to cough in the airplane. This tin can when we're all, you know, locked together. So I became very nervous at one point. So, and, and I thought, well, let's practice RAIN. So the first step was to recognize what was happening. So I decided to put things into words. So I described my state to myself. I don't remember exactly how you worded it, but what I will usually do is just, I will use the first sentence that comes to my mind. So whatever comes as a natural description, I will use that. Then it was acceptance. Sort of seeing that in this very moment, I am the kind of person that feels anxious or worried or suffocated or trapped, or whatever. Then what you do is you investigate. If I'm, if, if this is how I feel right now, if this anxiety is overpowering me right now, how, what are the consequences of this anxiety? How is it coloring my perception? The way I like to look at emotions is that they, they function like Instagram filters or Visco filters, whatever app you like to use, um, in the sense that they will amplify some things, some colors, and they will block out some other colors. So when I'm anxious, 
I'm more likely to notice whatever is causing my anxiety. So in the situation with the airplane, I will focus on people, be, people being close to me, people not wearing masks, people coughing. But I will exclude all those people who are just sitting calmly and, I don't know, reading a book with a mask on. Because if I'm anxious about COVID, what I will amplify is those things that will make me even more anxious. So when I investigate the, an emotion, that's how I approach it. I see how is this filtering reality for me? In what way am I ignoring some aspects of my existence and amplifying others? And then non-identification sort of comes naturally out of this. Once you realize that you're now specifically perceiving some things or thinking in certain ways because of the way you feel, you're already sort of slightly separating from your emotions because you know not to trust them fully. You can go on to investigate anxiety. And for example, I can think maybe a constructive thing would be is to see how I can take care of myself in that situation. So that would be Kelly's approach, like to see what's the tool that I need now to feel safe. But when, when we do RAIN technique, we primarily aim to sort of pull out of an emotion, to let it be and not be affected by it. Because if you know the way an emotion is, is playing with your sense of reality, then you know not to take it very seriously. It's kind of when you know that uh, a magician is doing a magic trick, you're less surprised because you know that somehow he's cheating. You just don't know how, but you know that's what he's doing. Or, for example, when politicians rely on the same crutch all the time, when they have the same talking points, at one point, it doesn't matter if that's a true thing or not. When you recognize a talking point, you immediately dismiss it because you just know that it doesn't matter. It's not important. You don't identify with it anymore. You don't, you're not upset by that talking point anymore. You may have been in the beginning, but once you recognize that they're using the talking point to make you upset, they stop making you feel upset. Because once you recognize the talking point as a talking point, it loses its power over you. So I hope that makes sense as a, as a, as a description of, of how RAIN works. And I will uh, stop here now and Thank you for, for being so patient with me, and I'm sorry for, for taking longer than, than I said I would. So I will go to your questions uh, right now. Uh, when can we ask questions? Well, you can ask questions now, or you, you, you could have asked them before, so anytime. Now would be a good moment as well. Uh, I have all the common traits of trichotillomania. And they're, they really uh, go up when I try to study. I try my best, but everything ends up in, in vain with a bunch of hairs. What should I do? I really want this to stop. So um, I'm not sure if this, I hope this webinar gave you at least some ideas how you can approach this. But if studying is causing you to pull your hair, then what my next step would be was to think, what is it about? Um, what is it, how is studying make me feel? Is it anxiety or is it stress or is it uh, fear that you may not be able to learn what you want to learn and then address that emotion? You can practically, when you study, you can apply any of the techniques that I've described, but since studying is something that we usually have schedules for, then we can also change up the way we approach studying to make it less stressful, if indeed stress is what, what's worrying you. So if, if studying causes stress, what you can do is you can break it up and make sure to include breaks when you study. And then in these breaks, you can apply some of the techniques that I talked about here. You can take a walk, you can do mindfulness, you can do something to break it up and therefore make it less stressful. Because one thing about stress is that it accumulates. And then the, the longer you study, the more stress you will accumulate. If you study in half an hour intervals and all together, let's say five hours, well, that's quite a lot, but let's say that much. It's not the same if you break it up in those little intervals or if you sit and then study for five hours at a time. When you study for five hours without de-stressing breaks, you will experience much more stress than if you study in total five hours over the whole day and then you break it up into little bits and pieces. So that's one way to approach that. 
But I, what I would encourage you to do more is I would encourage you to explore, um, I would encourage you to 